life on earth holds no greater challenge than the complicating daily demands of choosing among competing alternatives for our time. Here's another quote out of the same book. Our lives are the sum total of all the decisions we make every day, and those decisions are determined by our priorities. It's that simple. How many of you know what I just said is very, very true? How many have ever uh, liked something and went ahead and bought it because you wanted it, and then you go back to the scripture, it says God supplies all your needs. You didn't say all the wants, it's all the needs. And then you say, God, why am I in such a financial dilemma? Well, we, we go after things we want rather than the needs. He's already got that covered. Amen. And what I found out in life is, as I've gone along and followed the stewardship principles of the Word of God, placing Him first in everything, my priorities are always Him, I find out I have a surplus as I've gone along. Amen. This church has a surplus right now of so many things, one of the things being uh, some extra money we've never had before. But you know how that happened? Because we're always giving and giving Amen. and giving, and it comes back. Amen? Amen. Uh, we, I can't say too much about this, but Paulie found out about a need of a pastor uh, and, and, uh, financially. So we're going to send him some money. Amen. He doesn't know who we are, and we don't know who he is, but that's what we're going to do. That's what the Holy Spirit said to do. Amen. See, when you move on, when you move to where the Holy Spirit is, and you move to the Word of God, you never look for man to say thank you. Is it nice when somebody says thank you? Yes. But if they don't, and you've been led by the Spirit of God as I have, you don't look for a thank you because the thank you comes from Him. Amen. Say hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. See, I love to give. How about you? Amen. It's one of the greatest things because Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served. He gave His life. And Paul said, His life was poured out like a drink offering. Amen? Amen. My life's like that. I'm praying that your life, if it's not... It will get that way. Go over to Genesis real quick. I want you to see something before we get into a little bit deeper part of the message. Look at verse 8, Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God. Let me say that again. From the presence of God among the trees of the garden. The Lord wants you to know something, and for me to know something, that in today's society, it's no difference. We are hiding ourselves from the presence of God. Uh, people say, well, the Ten Commandments, that's old-fashioned, that's old. Listen to me. One of the Ten Commandments is this. Have no other gods before you. There are other gods before the church today. There are other gods in the world that block out the living God. In James, it says this, that the Holy Spirit is jealous. He's a jealous lover. Why? Because we have given so much of our time and effort to priorities of the world rather than the priorities of his presence. Seek first the kingdom of God. The word kingdom and the word dominion that Jesus, uh, God told Adam and Eve are the same words. He's the second Adam, and he came to bring dominion and to bring the kingdom of God here. The kingdom of God puts the king first. There are too many gods in front of the living God in our lives. Go over, if you don't mind, to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days will come, set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, Hard to deal with and hard to what? Hard to bear. I personally, as a pastor, among pastors and among believers, have never seen so much fear inside the house of God. Fear is a spirit. Fear got its start in the Garden of Eden. Out of a choice. Because Eve listened to Satan that had taken over the serpent to and used the serpent to talk to Eve, and it brought utter fear into her life. She only had one voice. Go like this, one voice. And then all of a sudden, a flood of other voices come in. We have too many gods before us, and it's not the living one. 
Some believers are living through social media and can't find their Bibles. And I hear fear coming up. Well, fear comes from seeing or hearing something. But the Bible talks about the fear of God. If you have the fear of God, you don't have the fear of men. The Bible says the fear of men is a snare. You and I do not have to live in fear. But believers are trying to live in fear at the same time fearing God. Can't do it. We've got to shut down the voices that are in our life, the voices that are yelling to us, <clears throat> excuse me, and speaking words to us that are contrary to the Word of God. For people will be lovers of self, utterly self-centered, lovers of money, aroused by inordinate greed, desire for wealth, proud, arrogant, contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. This is not talking about the world. This is talking about the church. The Bible warns us about the apostasy, the great falling away of the church, for the very elect will be deceived. Well, how can that happen? It's very simple. We're listening to voices other than the voice of the Spirit of God. It's very simple. Well, I, I want to have, have devotion. No, you don't want to. You got to do it. Whatever, whenever I get up, if I don't get to it, I got to do it two hours later. My first and most important place is I've got to get the word in me. Jesus said two houses next to each other means two lives next to each other, and they both look identical. The problem was when the storms of life came, the one that was built, the foundation on the solid rock, hello now, here's the solid rock of the word of God stood the storms. But the one built on sand collapsed, total collapse. We have got to get to a place, church, where fear stops knocking at our door. And the only way that's going to happen is when this takes the priority in our life. I've cut off all, all, social, I cut off all news media. How could you do that and still live? I'm doing fine. But every once in a while, somebody leaves the window open. And I had somebody do some work at the house, and this person said this. This is no lie. This is, this is what the enemy does. Well, I don't know if you heard the news, Pastor, and before I could get my mouth open, there's going to be a shortage on TP. When he said that, oh, my God, I wonder if I have enough. <laughs> Serious. So I went to the store just to check the shelves out to see if there was enough. And then the Lord said, uh, I'm more than enough. But just those little words that snuck in that little door that was left open to crack caused my mind to start thinking. But doesn't the Lord say he'll supply all of our needs? But you see how that little thing snuck in, and then the Spirit of God and the Word of God began to rise on the inside of me, and I pushed that thing back. It wasn't me that pushed it back. It was the spirit of the living God that says, no, that doesn't belong here. That's not true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Fear brings confusion. Right now, you could cut confusion with a knife. Man does not know what he's doing. And because they're not serving a living God, I'm not talking about what side of the aisle, Men are not serving God. They're looking to men for answers. Sometimes in Christianity, we listen to those that are prophets. Prophets have a little bit of men in them. And sometimes prophets will say something that really wasn't from God. The greatest prophetic word you will have that has no doubts no words of man, it's the word of God that will set you free. Well, this prophet said this, and this prophet said that. Well, this prophet, Jesus Christ, said this, and nothing's changed. How many of you know when Jesus speaks, everything changes? When men speak, sometimes there's more confusion. Don't let the priorities of life squeeze the word of God out. Jesus and the Holy Ghost and God are jealous lovers. 
He wants you and I to treat him as number one in our lives. Seek first the kingdom. Then God will take care of everything else. But we're letting too much fear in our ear gates and in our eye gates affect the word of God and what it says. I gave you an example because the door was open to crack. Before I can get out, no, it's too late. They're out there somewhere. The third verse. They will be without natural human affection. Hey, church, it's all over the airwaves. What we're seeing does no longer line up with this precious word. I love everybody. I've talked to folks and all over the... I love them dearly, and I talk to them about the love of Jesus. Can't be judgment that comes out of our heart. But when we're taking it in our eye gates, when we're taking it in our ear gates, and it's now becoming the norm, the church had better rise up and begin to speak. The church had better rise up and get preachers in the pulpit that are not afraid or ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what the word says? If the preacher can't be ashamed, the church of Jesus Christ had better not be ashamed. (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God, we've got to rise up stronger than ever before. We are the hope of the world. The world is waiting for an answer, and men don't have an answer, but the church of Jesus Christ has the answer. And it can't be watered down, can't be broken down. Put on some, uh, we'll take the pill with a little applesauce, amen? So, hello, no, we've got to give them the word in love and speak what the word of God says. In this chapter, he's talking about the great falling away of the church. Say the great falling away. It's called the apostasy. And the Bible says, before Jesus comes back, this will be one of the signs. Don't let that happen to Harvest Church. Don't let that happen to your family. Don't let that happen to anything around you. You speak the word, speak it in power and authority. If you and I could only realize what we have in Christ Jesus, we are light and we are salt. We have everything that this world needs. Amen? I know people that work in different places and they're around folks that aren't believers all the time. And they, they listen, their light is shining so bright, people are being drawn to them. Because they're talking Jesus in every word they say without quoting one scripture verse. You ever try that one? Well, such and such. No, don't say that. Just say Jesus loves you. That's all. God cares about you. See, that's the word. I'm about preaching this gospel. I'm not going to stop preaching this gospel. It's the only answer that this world needs and needs right now. Amen? I think I told you I've got one Bible from years ago. I think it's out of print. And I put it right here in all, where all my Bibles are. In the side of it says the answer. I look at that and say the word is the answer. Every time, the answer. How are people going to know unless somebody tells them, all right? I'll let you read the rest of that chapter. Fair enough? Well, let's go to a very famous verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. God's not giving you a spirit of fear. So if God doesn't give you fear and it's a spirit, where does it come from? It comes from evil. It comes from Satan himself. Say this out loud, God has not given you, talking to Timothy, but you and I a spirit of fear, but of what? Power and of love and of what? Say a sound mind. Amen? Listen to this, if you don't mind, this uh, rendering of what we just finished in 2 Timothy 3.1. You emphatically and categorically need to know with unquestionable certainty that in the very end of days, listen now to this statement, when time has sailed into its last port, we're there. Perilous times doesn't just mean where we are. My parents lived during World War II, perilous times. Other generations lived through the Great Depression, World War I, Korean War, all kinds of things crazy that goes on. I was a young man, a teenager, when John F. Kennedy was shot. I didn't know about voting, what party was what. All I know, he was my president. And when he got shot, the innocence of this country took a hit. And it's never come back from that since. And on the same, listen, almost on the same weekend, his, another guy gets killed. When I was in the military in 68, uh, his brother got gunned down. You see, once that ball starts rolling, it doesn't stop. I'm here to tell you, we are in the last of the last days. This is the end of the age. How long will it be, Pastor? The Bible doesn't say, but I got news for you. No time has ever come in the history of mankind 
where we're pulling into the last port. Amen. When Noah got into the ark, listen, the Bible isn't saying he shut the door in the ark. God had to shut the door. People start banging on the door. Let us in. This generation cannot bang on the door of the church and have the church doors shut because nobody will let them in. We're letting them in now. We're letting them up all the way up until Christ comes back because the church has the answer in Jesus' name. Amen. Say, I'm the church. The church isn't this building. The church is you and I. The church means people. When time has sailed its last port, and no more time remains for the journey, that last season will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times that will be emotional, difficult for us to bear. Guess what? We are pulling into the last port. Time is running out. Amen? Amen. But the church has the answer today. It will have the answer tomorrow. It will have every time we open our eyes and are able to speak the love of Christ out of our lives, God is going to save people. The Bible says the harvest is, but the laborers are. So what else is new? Jesus said there will be two in the field, one taken, one left behind. That's 50%. The church can change that, you know. I said the church can change that. I said the church can change that because people see us living our lives and as we live our lives, they're being drawn because of the love of Christ on the inside of us. Amen. Time is coming into its last port. Amen. This is it. Amen. When is Jesus coming back? Well, even he doesn't know. The Bible says God hasn't let his son know yet. But I got a funny feeling he got the white horse out of the stall and they're grooming him ready for the last trip to planet earth. Say glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Listen to the scripture I gave you last week for a moment. Mark 4, 40. And he said unto them, this is Jesus in the backside of the ship. He said unto them, why are you so fearful? Why is it you have no faith? Now the Bible says he's given each one of us what? A measure of faith. So all of us have faith, am I right? Just go like this. Say, I got the seed of faith right here. Maybe small. It's funny that when Jesus talked about that seed, he talked about a seed that's as small as a mustard seed. That's the smallest seed on the planet. But that seed is a powerful seed because God made it. You and I have the seed of his word on the inside of us, and it will do damage to the kingdom of God. But we've got to plant it with our mouth. Well, what happens if somebody doesn't like what I say and they reject me? They rejected Jesus Christ for you and me. There's going to be rejection when you tell people about Jesus because it's contrary to what the world's saying. See, people have got on the ship of fear and they're sailing. I'm still in port on the solid ground of God's word and I'm not waving at fear. I just hope they turn around and come back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Don't let fear grip your hearts anymore. Well, what should I do here? What should I do? Don't ask anybody. Ask the Holy Ghost. Ask, does the Holy Spirit know everything? Yeah. I want him on my ball team. Hallelujah. I want him batting cleanup. I want him batting lead up. I want him in every position of the field. I already know what the score is. We won. Amen. The score, we won. Amen. Come on, thank God we won. Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We won already. Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We won. Yeah. Say, come on, hallelujah. We won. Yeah. We won. Other people may know, not know they've won, but I know, and I'm going to let them know I know. Yeah. Say hallelujah, glory to God, and that goodness. All right, listen. What's the antidote for fear? Simple. Faith. The enemy would like to attack our faith every opportunity. But the Bible says this, fight the good fight of faith. Faith is a fight. Because doubt and unbelief and fear want to come in and want to douse out faith. It's not going to happen. I have faith because the Bible says he loves those that have faith. How many of you have faith? Don't listen to one person. Don't listen to one voice, but the one voice of the Spirit of the living God. God is jealous when there are too many voices in our life and they crowd and push God out. 
Where's your faith, he said to his disciples. Where is your faith? Because there shouldn't have been fear. They've been with Jesus. They've seen the miracles. They've seen all that he did, but they forgot his words. Listen, they forgot what Jesus said. What did he say? We're going over to the other side. This precious book called the Word of God says we're going to the other side. That's simple. Oh, I know, Pastor, but it's getting cloudy out. I said we're going to the other side. But the circum we're going to the other side. Stop looking at the waves. Stop looking at the storms because this book talks about the peace of God that passes all understanding. I'm challenged every day. I mean, you cannot believe I'm challenged every day. But you're the pastor, more so. What do I do? Rise up, not with fear, but rise up with the word of God, put it in my mouth, and begin to speak back to whatever's coming my way. Pastor, does it work? Listen to me now. It works every single time. Pastor, has it ever failed you? It, see, you're not listening. It works every time. Notice I didn't say, did you hear what I said? Listen to it. So if I say God's love, you hear that, but now you have to listen to it and understand that God says we're to love everybody. See, that's listening to it. Well, I, I know, but there's this guy, in the, oh, be quiet. Grow up. Forgive the person. In light of eternity, forgive the person. My God, we could be sending somebody to hell with our words instead of accessing heaven for them. You and I may be the only Bible people read. Here's another scripture verse, can we? I got a few minutes left. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. I like this one. We have the same spirit of faith. What does it say in Timothy? God has not given us the spirit of fear, which means it's a spirit. But what does the scripture verse say here in 2 Corinthians 4, 13? We have the same spirit of faith according as it is written. Whoa. So God gives us what? The spirit of faith. It's a spirit. Say the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in here. Do you realize now in the Old Testament put the spirit of God in the Ark of the Covenant and they had to carry it with long bars on their shoulders, and if anybody touched the ark, they dropped dead. It happened to one guy. It was starting to shift. He, grabbed, he was dead. That same spirit that killed people now raises them from the dead. And that spirit lives on the inside of you and I. Hang on now. The same spirit that entered the tomb of Jesus Christ and raised him from the dead is the same spirit that lives in you and lives in me. So how in the world does fear get into the believer? Say, God has given us a spirit of faith. According as is written, I believe, here's the key now, I believed and therefore I spoke. Get your Bible for a minute. We're almost done. Almost done. Go over to Hebrews. Powerful. Powerful. Let us hold fast the profession the word profession means confession. So what does it say? Let's put the word confession where it belongs. My God. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So if the word of God says something, what are we to do? Confess it out of our mouth. If we believe it, then we confess it. When those two are lined up, you can say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and cast into the sea, and it will be. And I don't know if I mentioned this on a, what day I mentioned it, but if you study Kenneth Hagin's life early on, he wasn't supposed to live past a certain age. Somebody gave him a Bible, and it took him, I don't know how long, just to turn a page. And somebody said to him, don't you read anything else? He said, there is nothing else. And when he finally got to Mark, say unto this mountain... He spoke to his body. Guess what happened? His body reacted to the word of God. And Kenneth Hagin lived a long, healthy life, but he was supposed to be dead. See, what man says we're supposed to be is contradicted by the word of God. Amen. 
He preached many years. The faith movement came from his lips. Or Robert said, seed time and harvest, going on to be with the Lord. But that little scripture verse in Genesis put the Christian church on the map. Seed time and harvest. What does that mean? When you put a seed in, there's going to come a harvest time. If we put it with our mouth, there's going to be a harvest that comes about. I remember Rodney Howard Brown, it was, it was Christmas Eve a number of years ago, and his daughter had cystic fibrosis. She wasn't supposed to live by a certain age. She made it almost, I think, to 20, some years old. He called me up on a Christmas Eve. I said, what's going on, Doc? He says, she's gone. What? And he started talking. He talked to me for over an hour. I didn't even talk. I just listened to him, bawling his eyes out. And then he said this to me. He said, he said Doc, my daughter won more people to Christ in her lifetime than others do if they live to 80 or 90. And he dedicated, listen, the rest of his ministry on earth to winning souls in honor of her. Don't let a sickness or a disease slow you down or stop you because Jesus and the Word are far above that. Believe it, then speak it. The problem happens here is if we don't see it right away, we say, God, you failed me. But we've learned in studying here at, at Harvest Church on a Wednesday night, healing is the beginning of a process. I pray for this person to be healed and nothing happened. Yes, it did. It didn't happen with you or me. It happened in the Word. And if you and I will speak the Word and hold on to it tightly and have it come out of our lips, my God, have mercy. But it's not a miracle. A miracle is something that instantaneously happens, but a healing is something that takes place over a process of time. Amen. So sometimes we got to pray like this. I'm praying for a miracle. Or I'm praying for healing to come. Amen? But those that believe and therefore speak, listen to it now, believed and have spoken and also believe, and therefore they do what? They speak. If we can get to a place, and I want to get you to that place, where we start living in the presence of God. If we're living in the presence of God, there's no room to be living somewhere else. Say living. living. On a daily basis in the presence of God. Submit yourself to him fully. Say submit yourself to him how? Say fully. Listen to what it says, and I'm almost done. James chapter 4, verse 7, the Amplified. Stand firmly against the devil. <laughs> when it says submit, uh, forgive, resist the devil, and he'll do what? Flee? No, no, but first it says submit. The word submit is a military term. God is wanting us to submit to him on a daily basis fully. Let me finish this verse, and we'll get out of here. Fair enough? Listen to it. Stand firmly against the devil. That's right. Unbending, unyielding, in the way you resist him so that he knows he's up against a serious contender. Say, I am a serious contender. Serious. No question about it. But it doesn't say resist the devil first. He says what? Submit. Listen now, now. If you'll take this kind of a stand against him, he'll tuck his tail and run like a criminal who knows the day of persecution is upon him. Once you start resisting him, he will flee from you in terror. See, if you and I will submit ourselves to God and the Word of God, because it's a military term, we are serving the King of kings and Lord of lords. One scripture verse calls God the commander-in-chief. The President of the United States is called the commander-in-chief over all military forces. Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, is my commander-in-chief. And this Bible tells me everything I need to know. And if I'll submit myself to him and not submit to some other things like other voices and serve other gods, God is always going to be there for me. His presence will always be with me. Amen. Bow your heads right where you are for a moment. If you're watching by television around the, the globe, internet-wise, I want you to know Jesus Christ loves you, cares about you. He has the best in mind for you. I want you to find yourself a good church. How do I know a good church, Pastor? You'll find one that's preaching the gospel. It's sometimes it's usually the one where not many people are there because they're preaching the gospel, but I'll leave that for another day, amen? Find the church where the pastor has a vision, help him with that vision financially, help him by doing whatever is necessary, and get yourself planted and tell your relatives and your friends, Jesus Christ changed your life, amen?